Good day. <laughs> it's my very great pleasure to be here, and I need to obviously recognize the organizers of this fantastic meeting, and principally David Christian, who I met about two years ago in Geneva. We were attending a meeting on governance uh, that was sponsored by the uh, Tolberg Tallberg Foundation of Sweden, and I had just read about David a few weeks earlier, and I realized this is the guy I was reading about. And so he and I start talking, and it was like a, setting a house on fire. You sort of couldn't stop us. And so in one way or another, we have been talking ever since. And so he was very kind enough to invite me to this meeting. I have to tell you that, um, yes, I'm a theoretical physicist, so if any of you watched that television show called uh, The Big Bang Theory, uh, I'm one of the real people who does that stuff. Um, now, we're not quite as ex uh, eccentric as the characters that you see in that television program, but there is a st very tall, minute grain of truth uh, in yeah. their representation of people in my community and what I do. Fortunately for me, however, I have four careers. My theoretical physics career is my second career. I'm in my 43rd consecutive year as a teacher, so I love to teach. I'm one of those odd professors that came to love teaching before he learned he could do research. And my second career is theoretical physics. However, what brings me here today is my youngest career. I am, at this point, what sometimes is referred to as a policy wonk. Uh, that means, of course, that People like me sit around and we try to figure out how government can be impactful in a positive way on the lives of the citizens in our country. Um, now this is actually very interesting because I never set out to do this. I, I was one of those kids that loved maths and you sat me in the corner and I was happy if I got the sign right. If it was a plus sign in the equation, I got it right. That made me very happy for a couple of weeks. Um, and so now I find myself in the position of, of policy advising to the President of the United States. And I must admit, this is, although it's my youngest career in a sense, about six, seven years old, um, I've been doing this at some low level my entire professional life. Uh, my policy advising chops, so to speak, first occurred in the country of South Africa. I, in 2004, was part of a group that came to look at some policy issues around science in South Africa. And I've sort of been doing it at that level ever since. So let's get started today. Challenges challenges of the anthropogenic policy making, a view from inside a policy formation organization. So what I'm gonna do is try to take you through a story, a journey that I've been on for the last six years, knowing a couple of facts. The first fact is that President Obama is not a climate denier. In fact, he's the opposite. So he's an anti-climate denier, whatever that might be. I guess that would be a climate supporter, I'm not sure. Um, and his science advisor, Dr. John Holdren, who we'll meet in, meet in this talk, is also someone who's actually worked around the issue of climate change for some time. And so you don't have to convince these people that climate change is real and that it's a threat to my country. And so we start off with those as our points of recognition. President Obama was elected in 2008 in an election that surprised many of us. And many people in the climate change community thought we would immediately get action on the climate front. And it didn't happen. So partly I wanna to talk to you about how if you're a citizen of a democracy and you have a concern about climate change, how you need to be able to put yourself in the minds of the people who lead your country as they wrestle with the issue of putting climate change along the train of issues that they see threatening your country. Let's see. Okay, there we go. So first of all, I wanna talk about civilization extinctors. Um, there's an a, a, a organization called the Global Challenge Foundation that did a ranking on what is really threatening for our species out there that we can see? And they found three, uh, 12 challenges, and at the top of their challenge is global climate change. Uh, other things are nuclear war, yeah, that danger still with us, global pandemics, ecological uh, catastrophes, um, global system collapse, major asteroid impact, after all, we don't want to follow the routes of the dinosaurs. Um, 
Super volcanoes, which is actually pretty much unrecognized. Synthetic biology, because we're getting to the point where we're getting so good in our science that we're almost at the stage where we can create artificial life. Uh, nanotechnology, this is new forms of matter and energy, new substances. In fact, yesterday we had this wonderful presentation um, about the geology, geology that comes from the uh, Anthropocene's change in the Earth's signatures. And yet now we're still continuing to create new substances that are going into the environment. And one part of science that's doing that is nanotechnology. Artificial intelligence. Um, that's a real scary one. If any of you have ever seen the movie The Terminator. So it's not that I expect Arnold Schwarzenegger to show up at my door knocking in the next week or two. But something like that in the sense of Robotics combined with artificial information technology, which is growing in intelligence, we can see that that potentially can come a threat. And I have to tell you that I was in a meeting about two months ago. We were in Camp David. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, is another member of the advisory council that I serve on. And Eric put this as an item that the country needs to be thinking about, about the dangers that might be out there around the issue of artificial intelligence. Unknown consequences and future bad global governance. So let's keep going. So first of all, there's a, something uh, that we really have to get used to, which is that in dealing with problems, both we as ordinary citizens and our governments have models in our heads. I call them the classical models of how problems work. And so if you have a problem you sort of expect that, well, it will get worse and worse and you'll find some kind of solution and then it will diminish. And if you'll notice about this, this, this minute diminishment, you'll notice it's nice and symmetrical. So we're used to these, what we scientists call normal distributions. And that's kind of built into our DNA in some sense and how you deal with problems. However, there's another kind of problem. This is what's called a fat tail distribution. And you'll notice it's highly symmetrical. And if you look at this, you'll see, notice that in this one, the problem gets worse and worse. And here you find a solution, but the problem does not follow a path that's nice and symmetrical going back to some state of nirvana. Instead, it has this long tail that goes out into the future. That's what we mean by a fat tail distribution. Now, it turns out that fat tail distributions are not something that we have a whole lot of experience in trying to deal with the consequences of. Because in our mind, at some level, we're always thinking, if we just get to a solution, we'll fix the problem. And that's what a normal distribution looks like. But for these processes that are governed by fat tail distributions, that's the wrong picture to have in mind. Fat, another fat tail distribution, not in the natural world, but in economics, we can see in the United States, if we look at the recent history of how economic crashes and recoveries go. In fact, they're starting the one here that you see out on the end. That's the 2001 uh, crash. That's not even 2008. But notice how much longer from the peak unemployment this goes than any curve before. And if we plotted the 2008 economic disaster, we would find it goes out even longer. So even in the realm of outside of natural science, this idea of a fat tail distribution is something we need to get used to thinking about. Um, this I'm borrowing, obviously, from the great work of Will Steffen and colleagues. And they have talked about the great acceleration where, and time and time again, actually in the last couple of days, we've talked about the fact that when you tr start to track metrics for how the earth is working and how the environment is working and how our social systems are working, you can find that we're on what's called a hockey stick. A long leading buildup, which is relatively flat, and then suddenly it shoots up like a hockey stick. And so that's kind of looking at a fat tail distribution from the other side. And so these flat, fat tail distributions are out there and affect our lives. Uh, you can look at world population, you can look at GDP, you can look at carbon, you can look at nitrous oxide, you can look at methane. All of these things are showing the same behavior. And presumably the ones on the right hand side of this earth systems, presumably that's because the environment is somehow responding to things that we're doing. 
Another presentation that was beautiful yesterday that I often try to explain to people who are not scientists, when they challenge us by saying, oh, the climate has changed many times before. And the answer to that is, yes, it has. But what it has not done is changed on the time scale that we are observing now. It has not done the hockey stick. It's like a new dance the world has learned how to do. So you have to, when you talk to the public, you have to be able to express these things in terms that they get. These are things that they get. So that's the threat we worry about. Now, ideally, if you were the leader of some country, you say, aha, some of my scientists bring a problem to me. Since I'm, you know, at least I think I'm a good person, if I'm not in fact a good person, I want to solve the problem. So you have these advisors around you, and then they say, oh, Mr. President, we have a problem. And they bring the problem, and then they say, we recommend X, Y, or Z. However, if you're the president, well, what problems are brought to you? Well, we live in what I like to call an accelerating, co-evolving ecosystem. Our technology is starting to act like a living thing. It has its own rules of evolution. And because of that, it's almost like there's a new species about that we have to pay attention to. So it's a co-evolving ecosystem is the right way, I think, to think about technology. Its rules are changing. This diagram shows that the rate at which it's changing. If you look at the use of the telephone, it took 89 years to go from zero users to 150 users, a million users. If we look at Facebook, it took five years to go from zero to 150 million users. So the rate at which the evolution of this, uh, what I call techno -ec ecosystem, is speeding up. Technology, boy. Lots of us worry about that. Uh, this is an article that appeared uh, in the New York Times, how technology wrecks the middle class. And this comes back to that issue, not so much of Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Terminator, but another kind of evolving, emerging behavior that we can see from technology. So in our country, we worry about robots. You probably do too. But we're at the stage where we can look at, and John is certainly here in the audience and talked about this a little bit yesterday with the econ economy of the country. We, look at, we can look at the trajectory of the kinds of jobs that are going to be coming forth, and we can talk to our business leaders to get that. And then you can compare that to the cognitive level that the average worker has on the basis of an educational system that was designed essentially for the 1950s. And you find there's a gap. And so one of the things that, uh, if you're the leader of the United States, you see this gap out there about how people are going to have the good life, and you wonder how you're going to fix that. Jo this job situation is changing. In fact, this is an article also that appeared in the New York Times, and this is all far removed from the Anthropocene. But if you're the leader of the country, these are the problems that are people going to put on your plate. So um, this is a very interesting uh, article. The nature of work that supports a middle-class life is changing rather dramatically in the U.S. Um, this is a plot where you see the pink curves are mostly uh, employment streams that are occupied predominantly by women. The blue lines you see are occupational streams predominantly occupied by men. And as the curve goes up to as you move towards the right, it means the number of people getting jobs in that area is increasing. If it's sloped downward, the number of people getting jobs in that area is decreasing. And you can look at that plot and you can say, you know, those American chaps, there's something wrong going on there. The majority of the jobs that men have traditionally used to support a middle class lifestyle in the United States is decreasing rather dramatically. We have a demographic change. So, for example, it, it turns out that in 2012, and I don't know what the situation is like here in Australia, but in the United States, as of 2012, the number of women who complete college became 57.4%. So the majority of our most highly educated workers are female in our country already. This is a departure from traditional patterns of education and employment. The demographic mix of populations in my country is undergoing rapid change. You, I, I know uh, since I've been here for a couple of days that you guys get our TV so you hear a lot of our problems. I don't know why you watch our TV, quite frankly. 
that, but that's just a personal issue I guess I have, but I've been watching TV here and I'm like, oh my God, some of the worst American TV comes and infects Australia. But you've been hearing about this problem because it's one of the things that uh, one of the Republican candidates <laughs> has decided to take as a horse to ride to victory. Now, I do have to tell you, and I've actually been talking with some friends like David, that should he be successful, there will be hordes of people like me looking to move here. <laughs> so we have this demographic change in the society. Technology creates these disruptors. In our society, we're starting to see the influence of drones, of new methods of thinking about personal transportation, such as Uber, new ways to think about accommodations instead of hotels, Airbnb, and all of these processes are driven by the information technology revolution, basically the internet. Self-driving cars are afoot. Now, you've probably heard about these things, and I remember the first time I saw a picture of one, it kind of looked like that, and I said, who would want to drive around with a car that had a trash can on top of it? But you can see by the end point of this, S, uh, this evolution, Tesla has a vehicle. I was, I'd say I was born in 1950. That means I'm a car guy. When I first saw this thing, I thought, yeah. <laughs> Self-driving cars, pretty cool. <laughs> However, it doesn't stop with cars. Because if you have the technology to produce self-driving automobiles, you have the technology to produce self-driving lorries, self-driving buses, and all forms of transportation that we're used to using to get about. And so, in fact, in China, there are already tests with self-driving buses in some of the cities there. This last one, when I saw it, which is the self-driving long-haul lorry built by Mercedes-Benz, which looks like that in a bigger picture, I remember thinking, hmm, looks pretty nice. It's a Mercedes-Benz. I actually own a Benz, so I think they're pretty trustworthy vehicles. But there are about 3.2 million Americans who make their living connected with long-haul driving. And now you put this disruptive technology right into the ecosystem, the techno ecosystem, and you can see that we're going to be in for some very interesting times. These are already street legal in the state of Nevada in the United States. So there's one state where you can already deploy these technologies for long-haul freight transport. I don't think Nevada will be the only state that will do this. And so, in our country, and in fact, this is an element we see around the world, there's been a great disconnect. Partly, apparently, driven by these technological disruptors where you find out that what I call the wealth sequestration effect has occurred, where a larger and larger fraction of the income of a country is captured by a smaller and smaller population in the country. If you're the president of the United States, this is something you have to worry about. More challenges, terrorism. In fact, our president recently made the statement that global climate change was the most prominent threatening challenge facing the country. And for saying that, he was taken to task by saying, by, again, people who are running for office, saying, how can he possibly say that? Because here's a greater terror for us. Here's a greater danger. And of course, it's a question of magnitude. Yes, this is a danger, but this is not an existential danger. This is not going to terminate my country, nor will it terminate yours. We have people like Mr. Snowden and Mr. Sang who come along and tell us that Big Brother is already here. Big Brother's into your Facebook account, into all of your computer accounts, and is spying on you. That doesn't sound very nice. And so, in fact, our, our uh, advisory group looked at this issue of big data and privacy at the president's request. And what we found was really scary. Turns out, no matter what you do, you can't stop it. Now, the, the Europeans are under the impression that you can implement what they call the right to forget. But if you look 
at the technological basis by which computers exist and their highly distributed systems, just because you press erase on one computer is no guarantee that all the information, all the places where that information might be residing also has a delete key. And in fact, it was our technical assessment that the right to forget does not actually exist. But the worst problem is, although you might be afraid of your government, um, there are other entities in our societies that actually hold far more information, at least a factor of 10 more. They're called corporations. They get it when you go online. Haven't you noticed how when you go online, the, adver the adverts on the side of the pages are a little bit more interesting for you to look at than they used to be? Do you really think that's an accident? There's this thing called data analytics that is applied to your use of the browsers every time you do that. And it's being done in order to figure out marketing opportunities for other people who want to know what might interest you. Or if you go to YouTube, you'll see the same effect. If you're um, a virgin user of YouTube, you'll get some random display of things that they think might interest you. But the longer you use YouTube, the more you will see links that are like the links you have watched before. That's data analytics at work. They, they are creating what I like to call a digital clone of you. So they can understand who you are. They have this digital version of who you are, what your wants are, what your desires are, for the simple reason that they want to market to you effectively. And it turns out corporations hold far more data about citizens than governments. Um, in my country, we've got this thing uh, called the Constitution, which you may have heard of. And in the Constitution, there is a First Amendment, which basically guarantees me the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But there's also Second Amendment, which actually, as it was written, ensures the right to have state militias. Now, unfortunately, we don't always teach reading so well in my country. <laughs> and so you can get through 12 years of education in the U.S., go and read the Constitution, and read it to say, ah, everybody's got a right to have a gun. Now, some distinguished um, jurists disagree with that. But in 1996, the Supreme Court essentially said, yes, you do. It was actually a change in the traditional position that the government had about gun ownership. And now, of course, I don't have to tell you what the result of that is. You hear about it in your newspapers once every few weeks. Whereas here in Australia, you folks kind of fixed this problem. You had this one terrible shooting of, oh, just over a decade ago, and you changed your laws. And I don't think you've had any mass shootings of that scale since then. We Americans, we Yanks, you know, we kind of, well, Sir Winston Churchill said it best. He said, you can count on Americans to find the best solution possible for any problem after they have tried everything else. <laughs> so we're just supporting Winston. We're in the phase now, it's very damaging, but we're doing the traditional American thing. <sighs> so, you're the President of the United States. All of that stuff that I just told you about comes on your desk. And there are groups of people and citizens and lawmakers who say you need to fix this stuff. So we have this constitution that sets out the form of our government. We have an executive, legislative, and judicial branch. All of the departments uh, that operate the government are under the executive, including our Department of Defense, Department of Agriculture, Commerce, Education, Energy, and so forth. This is in, you know, we know how to draw really complicated org charts. And so the government also begins to look like it's a system of systems of systems. But for the last six years, I've gotten to hang out in this part of the structure. It's called PCAST, the U.S. President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. PCAST has existed since the Second World War. It is a group of private citizens. We do not hold any official position in the government. However, we have unusual access 
to the government in terms of even security things. So we're private citizens and we are statutorily charged, as you can see this line here, we are statutorily charged to give advice to the president. Now we also advise the OSTP director, who's the science director, John Holdren, but our main charge is to talk to the president. PCAST meets six times a year. Of those six times, between two and four, we meet with the president. We are told that we're his favorite group to meet with. His schedulers hate us because if he has us on the schedule, it's likely to go long. And we've been told that part of the reason is that when we meet with the president, not only do we give him problems, we talk about solutions. Because scientists, after all, are very naive. We think we can solve things. Um, there's a web page we can learn about this. The Office of Science and Technology Policy is the agency in the executive government that speaks to issues of science technology for the president and is responsible for setting goals in the departments that are in the executive branch. I am what's called a special government employee. I love this title because it's, it's a, it recognizes the tremendous amount of salary that the government has to pay me for my advice. Zero dollars per hour. So a GSC is not actually employed by the government, but we have to have this title. Um, all of our reports essentially are open to the public. They're on the web pages. You just know the letters PCAST, you put in like climate change or cybersecurity or bioterrorism. Just do a search in Google and you can see our reports. We are essentially the White House think tank. We meet, as I said, with the president. Oh, I like, so this is a picture that's taken in 2012. You can see me sitting here. Here's President Obama. And I like to tell people, when you look at these pictures, the longer and darker my hair are, is, the further back in time we're looking. <laughs> so in this particular meeting, I was briefing the president on that meeting about some issues around STEM education. The president and the science advisor have a strategy, which remarkably enough, I understand your new prime minister seems to have taken elements of of an innovation strategy to, to drive innovation and economy in this country. There was just an announcement two or three days ago about his new program. These slides I'm showing you here are five years old from the USA. So if you compare the two, you'll see that there's some significant overlap. So we have a president who believes science can be brought to the needs of the nation. He's done things like we've had more Nobel laureates serving in our government in the last six years than we have ever had before. So he believes that scientists have something to say in governance. And it's not just around science and technology. So this is our group in 2009. You can see here's the present in the middle. These are uh, my brothers and sisters in PCAS, and we really do feel like a family at this point. We've been doing this for six years. Some of us drop out, like this individual. His name is Ernest Moniz. He's a physicist. He's now the current Secretary of Energy. But because he's officially part of the government, he can no longer be a member of PCAST. As I said, we meet with him in the White House. So these are pictures of some of our meetings. If you look very carefully, you'll see that the seating arrangements change. I always like to say that seating, when we get to meet with the president, it's like playing a game of musical chairs so that after some amount of meeting, every member of PCAST can go out and say, I sat next to the president. <laughs> Sometimes the vice president sits with us, and we always have great fun when Vice President Biden is in the meeting. And uh, we discuss this panoply of issues and more that I showed you in the introduction. So, we're here mostly to talk about the Anthropocene. President Obama was elected in 2008. The first statement on the Anthropocene and dealing with it did not appear until 2013. The first major statement. Now you'll remember at the beginning of this talk, I told you we didn't have to convince him about this. This is something he'd already accepted was very real. And yet, it took four years before the administration was willing to come out very forthrightly, and in fact, they, they came out a little bit before this, very forthrightly talking about climate change and, and mitigation. And now, of course, we know Paris is going on. And so you might wonder, why four years? Well, they're politicians, folks. During the first administration, even though there was an appetite by a number of people on our panel to deal with the issue of the Anthropocene, 
the political advisors said, no, don't do that. And we didn't. With a second term of office, the constraints are off, and the President Obama that you see now making statements the, about the Anthropocene, that's the real President Obama that we've known about for a while. Now, he's paid a political cost for this. Like I said, if you're a politician, it's always a cost-benefit analysis, something we heard about yesterday. There's always a cost-benefit analysis, especially if you're a politician. And so those folks do that. Even if they're good, they do that. That's part of their genetic structure. Um, these are some earlier reports that began to nibble around on the edges of the issue. So this is a report in 2011 on ecosystems and on uh, e ecosystem service valuation in particular. Something we heard about in this room yesterday about people saying, well, gee, you have to assign a monetary value to everything. I have to tell you that the people who work in uh, ecosystem service think that this is a way to overcome the problem, the people who are experts, and they're busy trying to do this. Ecosystem service valuation. And we also did a, uh, this is our latest report, which if we go to the, to the webpage now, this is the report where fully the president is engaged in the issue of climate change and has made statements and recommendations. But they're very strange recommendations in some ways. Okay. So is it possible to have a data-driven, evidence-based form of government? This is a very important question. There are people high in my government who will believe the answer is yes. I've shown you two pictures. One of them is uh, Dr. John Holdren He's here. Dr. John Holdren is a physicist. So you would say, yeah, this is someone who understands scientific culture. He also has a very long, distinguished career of interacting with politicians and kind of understands the rules for how to be effective in that domain. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Ernest Muniz, who I introduced to, to earlier, the person on the edge of the picture. He is currently the United States Secretary of Energy. He is one of the people that was at the negotiation table when we were looking to put limits on, nuclear, on, on Iran's nuclear arms acquisition programs. Ernie was one of the major people at the table discussing that. Um, Ernie also is, has an expert in energy and the grid in the United States. So these are real scientists in the political domain. Um, science diplomacy is something that is talked a lot about by this administration, where you take scientists and you kind of let them out of the box. And normally people think about having scientists in a box. That is, the scientist advises the political leadership on nuclear weapons, maybe some technological issues, and maybe education. But in this administration, we have seen signs and the Department of State, in particular, has a program on science diplomacy where scientists actually do begin to play the role of diplomats, at least en petite. Um, some opportunities and challenges I've seen in this environment. Well, the challenges, one of them is like I think of the mass media is a combination of Bacchus and Hypnos. Because in my society, and from what I have seen of your society, mass media is this enormous tsunami of content that enters every citizen's life every single day. Now, since we all have a finite bandwidth of the content or data that we are able to process in a given day, it means messages are crowded out. And this is a challenge if you're going to talk about making progress on, on uh, the Anthropocene and the policies that might be good policies to reach a good Anthropocene as opposed to a bad Anthropocene. In our country, we've seen a market diminishment of the power of the government. Now, again, I don't know about your circumstances, but in the United States, if you look back at World War II, our government essentially was at its at its peak in terms of power, what it can do in the society. That's diminished, folks. That's not true anymore. The United States government, although capable of destroying the world, which sounds like it's pretty powerful, it's not capable of getting all of its citizens to believe that vaccines are a good thing. This is a very odd definition of power. You can destroy the world, but you can't get your citizens to accept that vaccination of, your, of its children is a good thing. 
power is highly constrained in my country, and that's not something that is often appreciated, either by people who want to come in and make change, and I have to tell you that my current president was one of those people. I think he had underestimated the power of inertia that exists within various power centers in the country that constrain the government. However, there's a new tool that this administration has been trying to use. They call it public-private partnerships, where you engage external validators for the policies that the government would like to see implemented, and especially around the issue of climate change, the Anthropocene. One such example is the insurance industry. I don't know if any of you have friends who work in the insurance industry, but if you do, go and talk to them about the Anthropocene. Because you see, they've been thinking about this for at least a decade. So that's the kind of external validator that one could try to get as a partner as you go to talk to the public. That it's not these liberals with these grand, grandiose big government plans that are saying we need to do something about this. It's a person in business. Another center of completely realistic understanding of anthropocene in my country is the Department of Defense. So you could imagine that that's another place in the government that you could, well, technically they are part of the government, but for a lot of citizens in my country, they're kind of not part of the government in terms of their trustworthiness. So you need these kinds of validators. Um, but the biggest thing that I would tell you that I've seen in the last six years, and which is an, uh, a message I would especially deliver to this audience, because I have a sense that you are a group of activists. That's the sense I've gotten from the meeting. And activists tend to paint big business as an enemy, as an opponent, as something to be overcome. I can only tell you that in the last six years, as I've watched this administration try to make progress on a lot of issues, including the Anthropocene, the idea of public-private partnerships has been a useful tool. Now, we haven't gotten it to work on the issue of the Anthropocene, but on other issues like STEM education, it has worked very well. And so you need to start rethinking and reconfiguring your mind about who are the actors who are going to be effective in the domain. We need to deepen societal and cultural perspectiveness on science. So yesterday I heard and hear discussion about natural science, and it was correct, but as I talk to the public quite often, upwards of 30 times a year, and I'm on a stage sort of like this, I've learned a few things about talking to the general public. You've got to really say it in a language they understand. So what's natural science? Well, science is the study of your home. Natural science is the study of your home when you're not there. The social sciences, the um, liberal arts, and the humanities are the study of your home when you're there turning plugs off and on. This is almost literally a way to think about what we do as scientists. There are limits on science. Last night, David and I had a wonderful dinner with the uh, vice rector, vice chancellor of the university here. And one of the things that we had, we talked about in the discussion was the limits on science, because in fact, most people don't know science actually recognizes that it has limits. In fact, most people don't know that mathematics recognizes that it has limits. In mathematics, there's a very deep set of statements called Gödel's incompleteness theorem, and they actually tell you the limits of how you can do mathematics. In fact, one way to translate these, theor these two theorems is that you can't do mathematics without having a certain article of faith at work. Something that almost nobody in the public has ever heard of. We've got this economic sociological hockey stick, the failure of neoclassical economics. Many people know the system is broken. That disconnect in wealth sequestration, sequestration that I talked about is a symptom of it. There was this wonderful book by Piketty that came out within the last two years, also talks about this phenomenon. We don't know how to replace that. As mentioned by John, however, we need to have new models for thinking about economics. And it has to be more widely dispersed than just among the specialists, even though the system is optimized to keep the structure in place functioning as it is. 
So can we construct economies that are constructed that value what humanity is uniquely capable of doing? This is, in fact, a critical question. Because what is it that we are uniquely capable of doing? Uh, it used to be that you know, our ability to reason in a factory was something that we could uniquely do. Well, if you walk in a factory now, robots are doing it, driven by computers. That value of assessment of the human involved in the loop has therefore dropped. In fact, you can think about lots and lots of tasks, like those self-driving lorries that I showed you, where the valuation of a human doing that has suddenly dropped. And so if you're going to build an economy in the future, to me, the ultimate question of economy is how will we value what humans can do uniquely? And one of the things I would propose as an, a crazy, out of the left field idea is mass scale content production. Now, what in the world does that mean? Well, um, athletics do that. Athletes do that. They produce, when I say content, I mean data that you get, and there's two uses of data I've seen in my life. You use it for knowledge, or you use it to generate an emotional reaction. So when you get data in the, a data stream in the form of a beautiful aria, the purpose is to generate an emotional reaction, but it's a data stream. When you go and look at a painting, a beautiful painting, and then you have an emotional reaction, that's a data stream but you're using your emotional part of your brain to evaluate the value of that data stream. So one thing I would propose is that we start thinking in a, unit, a, unit, a, a unitary way about how we use what I call data. In fact, some people would say what I'm calling data isn't data because the formal use of data is normally thought to be science. But to me, data is what the brain takes in and processes. And so music is a form of data as far as I'm concerned. And I would say that we need to actually think about these similarities if we're going to try to get to the, answer the question, what is it that we humans are uniquely capable of doing? And I think this is one thing that's easily identifiable, the, the production of information streams that people react to in an emotional way. That's not what we scientists do, but that's what most people do. You, you go watch TV, right? You, you watch uh, rugby, or you go watch cricket, or you go watch Ultimate Fight Club, right? Those are all data streams. And their purpose is just to generate an emotional reaction. So the valuation of that and the capacity to do that offers at least one idea. Maybe it's impractical, but it's an idea to think about how to build an economy in the far distant future, not anytime soon, because this process of robots coming in is not going to be the Terminator. It's going to be the robots that do your work. It's going to be the rumba that sweeps your floor. That's going to be in your house. It's not going to be the Terminator. One of the things is a lever. is what we here have been talking about, and I certainly commend my host, uh, David, for this, because education is one of the ways that we can push back into this enormous data stream that mass media produces for our, our population. I like to think, yesterday as I, was, as I was watching David's talk and watching the interactions of the audience, I started to think, you know, there's something very interesting going on here because in some ways we are all repeating the path that Einstein took. You see, Einstein took the ideas of Newton, space and time, and in Newton's conception, these were very different things. There's this idea of what he called, Newton called absolute time. But what Einstein actually did is taught us that space and time are actually part of a greater whole. And it was from that insight that, for example, we get to do things like have a GPS system that works. And so in some sense, what big history is about from my perspective is this unitary view of human knowledge. I like to, as I said, I, I use this phrase, a general relativity of human knowledge. That's what big history is really doing. It's unifying different fields that people, where people thought they were distinct and putting them into a story, into a package to become more effective as we figure out how to plot the future of our species. So I think history actually plays a unique role here. Just like for Einstein, the challenge was time was so very different from the directions of space. Big history does things like teach us about the human family. That in fact, philosophers and men of religion have for decades talked about how we're all one family. But now science can tell us how closely we are related to each other. And that to me is a stunning development. That 
most of the world's population still does not know. So there's room for that information to get out. In the United States, there is a, a substructure that perhaps Big History will build on. We have been worrying about curriculum standards at K-12 level. And that's a place that can be a, provide a foundation, even though this one, the Common Core, is caught up in our politics right now. People like Donald Trump say, get rid of it. But some of us are hopeful that rationality will preserve, will actually win out, and that some remnants of this will begin to survive and enrich education in the country. But there's a, the thing that worries me most about climate change is not something we've talked a lot about here. I call it the tipping point monster. To understand the tipping point, let me first of all remind you of something. Here's a monster right there. It looks like a monster. This is a scene from the end of the movie, The Day the Earth Stood Still, which at least one of my friends in the audience will recognize. And in this movie, an alien comes to the Earth and tells a group of people of a danger that we're facing out in the future, a danger connected to our use of nuclear weapons that can, in fact, lead to our extermination. So there's this monster in this movie We've talked a lot about this. We've seen this curve several times, the Keeling curve, at the end of the hockey stick when we look at CO2. But there's another danger I worry about far more. And that's the monster I really worry about is methane. Because in fact, methane is also a greenhouse gas. Large quantities of methane are locked in the tundra in Siberia. And as you heat the planet, yes, you're going to melt the ice in Greenland and, and the Antarctic, but you also warm the tundra. And when you warm the tundra, the methane becomes volatile. And one could imagine that after a certain point that you will get large-scale releases of this gas. In fact, it's already started to happen. Uh, there were reports over the course of last year of mysterious holes appearing in the Siberian tundra. And at some point, at least one group of scientists have concluded that these are methane releases into the atmosphere. So we're already seeing this warming of the tundra. <sighs> that kid there is me at eight years old. I started dreaming about being a scientist around that time, actually a little bit longer than that, about four years I first started thinking about it. This is me in the 1990s in the middle of Siberia. And so these dreams of this one particular child actually had a chance to come true. I would like, and now me now, I have these really weird visions. You know, old men dream dreams, it says in certain sacred texts. So I'm an old man now dreaming mathematical dreams that are connected back to this 60, 60 years through time, back to this young version of me. And I have this enormous pleasure of being in the position to ask a fundamental question about the structure of space and time. To know that I have a relationship to space and time. And to be the first person to be able to ask a particular class of questions. Now, if I was extremely lucky, I would get the answers, and then you would say, ah, you're like Albert Einstein. But I don't know that I'm going to be that lucky. But I am lucky enough to have gotten to ask the questions. Those dreams have come true. And so, at the end of the day, this is really what it's about. It's about our home. It's about us as a family. And facing the threats of the Anthropocene is really, <coughs> excuse me, is really a statement of our love of ourselves and wanting to preserve into the future the possibility that the dreams of children can come true on this planet. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah.